Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Lord Father, Mr. Packle. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we bring you the writings of the church. And we are at this point working through fides et ratio, faith and reason. Now, if you would like to read along with us using a paperback copy of Fides et Ratio, you can go to EWTN's Religious Catalog for, for one. Uh, online, you, you can go to the website EWTNRC.com or you can call them at 1-800-854-6316. And, or if you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Fides et Ratio by going to our website, EWTN.com, the main website. And then you'll see libraries, click that on, go to Documents Library, and then type in Fides et Ratio. And you might add uh, uh, John Paul II uh, for author. And you can then call that up and download it into your computer. Now, of course, we'd love to have you involved and participate in our show. One way is to come here to Birmingham. And you can be in our studios. We'd love having you come and join us. Another is to send us a question through email by writing us uh, uh, the threshold at EWTN.com. Threshold at EWTN.com. And we'll try to get to some of those. Now, we have gone through the first 99 paragraphs. And here at paragraph 100, where we start today, we are beginning the section that is the conclusion of this. So it'll take us about nine paragraphs, two, three shows to go through this. So let's take a look at this. He begins by reflecting on Pope Leo XIII who wrote a wonderful encyclical, much shorter than this one, but it's called Eterni Patris. And by the way, you can also get that online. That's also at the same website. You can download that encyclical and still worth reading. But he wrote that in 1879. And he has referred to it many times throughout. And he wants to revisit uh, that's the reason he wrote this encyclical, is to revisit in a more systematic way this issue of the relationship between faith and philosophy. That's what he's trying to do in this encyclical. He also wants to do so and uh, see it in the development of culture and to see it in terms of the patterns of personal and social behavior so everybody can understand it. That's that's what he's been trying to do throughout this whole encyclical. Also, he mentions that philosophy exercises a powerful, not always obvious, a lot of times we are not aware of how philosophy affects what's going on in the, the culture. Um, and we also don't always see how it affects theology and the various disciplines of theology. And I've mentioned in the past a philosopher named Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher, had a major impact on New Testament. He didn't write about the New Testament, but a friend of his, Rudolf Bultmann, took his ideas and applied it to theology. And for a good many years in the middle of the 20th century, Rudolf Bultmann was the dominant theologian of New Testament research. And a lot of people were not aware that his conclusions came from the philosophy or the influence of the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, as well as his own research. So that's a good example of that. And there are a lot of other examples of how various kinds of philosophy affect theology, not always for the better. And what we've talked about many times is how the philosophy that is at the, the core of modern day 
relativism has a lot of impact on the way people think theologically. For these reasons, Pope John Paul judged it appropriate and necessary to emphasize the value of philosophy for the understanding of faith, as had uh, Pope Leo XIII. Pope Leo XIII also made it clear that we need to use philosophy to understand theology better, as well as understand the limits that philosophy faces. Philosophy does what it can, but it also has its limits, especially when philosophy neglects or rejects the truths of divine revelation. God's revelation opens up avenues for philosophy to go more deeply. So he is pointing out in this encyclical that the church remains profoundly convinced that faith and reason must mutually support each other. They need each other, they help each other, they give to each other, and each influences the other as they offer each other a purifying critique. They help each one to see the strength of the other. And philosophy and theology stimulate each other to pursue deeper understanding. That's the goal. That's what he wants to see happen. And that's why he wants us to understand more philosophy and theology. So that that mental component of being human that is distinctively human is able to be there for us. And in this, he cites Vatican I uh, in the dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith, which is called Dei Filius, section or chapter 4, where he quotes, not only can faith and reason never be at variance with one another, but they also bring mutual help to each other, since right reasoning demonstrates the basis of faith and illumined by its light perfects the knowledge of divine things, while faith frees and protects reason from errors and provides it with manifold knowledge. And in fact, Pope Leo XIII very clearly and strongly reflected on that as well. We continue on in paragraph 101, um, where he says, a survey of the history of thought, especially in the West, shows clearly that the encounter between philosophy and theology and the exchange of their respective insights have contributed richly to the progress of humanity. And in fact, Pope Leo XIII in his encyclical develops that idea. He goes through the history of various ways in which philosophy and theology help each other and give mutual support. That's why I urge you to get that Eterni Patris and download it and read it. It's not real long. It's only 32 paragraphs. Endowed as it is with an openness and originality, which allow it to stand as the science of faith, because that's, that's what theology is. Theology is the science of faith, the study of God. Theology has certainly challenged reason to remain open to the radical newness found in God's revelation. For instance, through reason alone, it is possible, as Vatican I made very clear, it is possible to use reason to discover that God exists. But what you cannot find from theology is what God says in Scripture, namely, that He loves us and He loves creation. One of the points that Pope Leo brought out is how some philosophers thought creation was evil, created by an evil God. 
They didn't know that God loves us. Well, Revelation says, no, this is something that God loves. He loves humanity. He loves creation. And he makes human beings in his image and likeness. That was something philosophy could not derive on its own. And that's a good example of how theology challenges philosophy to go into something more deep. Otherwise, you could see as some philosophies have done, uh, which is to say there are some people who are supermen and they deserve to survive. And you take that philosophy beyond what uh, Nietzsche, it was the philosopher that said that, um, you take it beyond even what he said and you end up with the Nazis. So bad philosophy has bad consequences. Again, another point that Pope Leo made very clear. And it has been an undoubted boon for philosophy that has glimpsed new vistas of the further meanings of life, which reason is called upon, it's summoned to penetrate that new meaning, to understand if God makes us in his image and likeness, then there is an inherent dignity in every human being. And philosophy develops that, and Pope St. John Paul was excellent at developing that. Precisely in the light of this consideration, and just as I have re reaffirmed, that is, the Pope has reaffirmed, theology's duty to recover its true relationship with philosophy, I feel equally bound to stress how right it is that for the benefit and development of human thought, philosophy should discover its relationship with theology. Again, throughout this whole encyclical, he keeps emphasizing that philosophy and theology go back and forth. Each one benefits from the other. He doesn't want to see one without the other, but both of them always helping each other to make human beings even more deeply rooted in their own dignity, the dignity of their nature as human beings capable of real thought and reason, but at the same time capable of loving God. So that philosophy and, and faith go together. He goes on, in theology, philosophy will find not the thinking of a single person. Now, why does he say that? Because when you look at the history of philosophy, you'll see that philosophies are named after individual philosophers. And therefore, each philosophy is the thought of a particular genius. And most of these philosophies are geniuses. They may have forgotten certain things. Maybe they didn't think through everything, but they are great geniuses. So you have Platonic philosophy named after Plato, Aristotelian philosophy named after Aristotle. You have the philosophy of Kant, which is called Kantian, Heideggerian, and so on. So every philosopher is one individual whose thought is put into his or her particular philosophy. That's why he brings up that uh, philosophy is, uh, will, it will find not the thought of a single person when they look at theology, because theology is not the theology of a particular individual. Even, no matter how rich and profound an individual might be. But um, theology is the wealth of the reflection of a whole community, the church or of ancient Israel. So theology is based on the communal reflection 
of Israel for the Old Testament and of the church in the New Testament. So that's something that's very key. For by its very nature, theology is sustained in the search for truth by its ecclesial context, that is, by the context of the church. It's the whole church that sustains the theology's search for the truth. Now, he makes reference here to his first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, paragraph 19, where he says, I quote, Nobody can make of theology, as it were, a simple collection of his own personal ideas, but everybody must be aware of being in close union with the mission of the teaching truth for which the church is responsible. Now, this sense of the church being the context of theology, because it's the church through which we have scripture and the church through which we have the apostolic tradition. And you cannot have that outside the church. You don't have, no individual passed on scripture or the tradition, but the church. And this gets at the issue of the necessity of the church. It's not an extra, it's not some oppressive institution. It is the body of Jesus Christ established by him for the sake of the salvation of the world. And there's the tradition of the whole people of God with its harmony of many different fields of learning and culture within the unity of the faith. So for instance, we have people who are great exegetes of the scripture, like St. Jerome, of course, the primary one, but many others who uh, explain the text of scripture. St. Augustine did that, St. John Chrysostom, and many others. Well, other theologians went deeply into understanding aspects of systematic theology, explaining the mystery of the Trinity to the best of their ability or the sacraments, and so on. So this is absolutely key. Now it goes on. Insisting, this paragraph 102, insisting on the importance and true range of philosophical thought, because the, the, this is what the church does. The church insists that philosophical thought uh, is a wide range. It deals with a wide variety of issues. And the church has taught those various issues over the centuries. For instance, philosophy deals with the rules of logic. When Charlemagne wanted to, to, wanted to start a school system, of course, he went to the church. And it was the Benedictine monks that he went to, especially Alcuin, to start the first school system. And one of the topics they studied was logic. But they also studied music, because music is so mathematical and logical. They studied mathematics and astronomy, and then other aspects of the history of philosophy. So the, the church knows that there, uh, it, there's a true range of philosophical thought. And all of it is important in that the church promotes both the defense of human dignity and the proclamation of the gospel message. And there is today no more urgent preparation for the performance of these tasks than this, to lead people to discover both their capacity to know the truth and their yearning for the ultimate and definitive meaning of life. So these tasks are key to lead people to the truth. Here, he makes reference to his letter, Dignitatis Humanae, the dignity of humanity, uh, human dignity, where he says, 
all men are bound to seek the truth, especially in what concerns God and his church. And they are bound to embrace the truth they come to know and to hold fast to it. The truth cannot impose itself except by the virtue of its own truth as it makes its entrance into the mind at once quietly and with power. Moreover, as the truth is discovered, it is by a personal assent that men are to adhere to it. Now, what is going on in this that, that section? The truth is what the human mind was made for. And he wants us to embrace the truth. This you know, stands against the attitude of relativists in our culture who say there is no such thing as absolute truth. Their patron, I don't want to say patron saint, because it wasn't a saint, but their patron is Pontius Pilate, who as he stands in front of Jesus says, what is truth? in a cynical tone of voice. And that is not the attitude of a Christian. We are not cynical about the truth, but we seek to embrace it for the only reason that it's true, not because of what we can get out of it. Things will, good, goodness will come from the truth, but we seek the truth for its own sake. And that's key. And then the second task is the human yearning for ultimate and definitive meaning of life. As I said last week, this is key for understanding. If we don't see that the end of the world or the end of our individual lives has any meaning, then we won't see any meaning to life itself or to the lives of other people. We won't see any purpose. And we must understand, to be fully human, we must understand that life has a meaning. If we don't see a meaning to life, we will end up seeking selfish pleasure or the death of other people to meet our political power. We'll try to be in control of life instead of understand its meaning. Pay attention to those who are politically minded that simply want control and power. They have shown up as dictators throughout the centuries. And they will appear today and can appear in the future because they don't see the meaning of life. But having, seeking that meaning of life is absolutely key for being human. And it evokes from us a deeper uh, sense of authentic humanity. So these are profound needs, the need to know the truth and the need to know life. And by the way, just as another little test for you, in terms of knowing the truth as a good goal, how many of you like being lied to? Anybody? Do you like it? When somebody tells you a lie? No, of course not. That in itself is a good basic indicator that your mind was made for the truth. Your reaction against being lied to. Parents typically expect their children to do stupid things. But when they lie about it, that really hurts a parent more than the stupidity. And this is something that just, again, indicates we're made for the truth. And then if we seek the truth, then we seek the meaning of life. These are profound needs. And that these needs are inscribed by God in human nature. God makes human nature to desire the truth and meaning. And, the, uh, and that the human and humanizing meaning of God's word emerges more clearly. 
what God has revealed in His sacred scripture, in sacred tradition, reveals to us more deeply the meaning of life, again, as made in His image and likeness, bearing a dignity that is inherent to us and inherent in every other single person who comes into existence. And this is going to make us better people. Through the mediation of a philosophy that is true wisdom, not a philosophy that leads you to folly, but a philosophy that leads you to true wisdom, people today will come to realize that their humanity is all the more affirmed the more they entrust themselves to the gospel and open themselves to Christ. As they see in the gospel the truth that Jesus Christ has revealed, and as they come to know Him and engage in a deep relationship, coming to know Him through prayer and meditation, through repentance of sin and a change of life, coming to see the need for His grace to be able to change our lives. Even if we know what we're supposed to do, it's very hard for us to make a change of life without the grace of Christ. That is what we come to know. And that is the good news that God gives to us to ennoble everybody. And, you know, I mentioned last week that I had been to a prison I could not help but be extremely impressed by those men of varying ages. Most of them were converts. Many of them had no religion at all. Some had heard a little bit of religion and never got into it very much. A few had rejected the truth, the teachings of their faith and so on. But as these guys experienced two things. One, Catholics coming in there to evangelize them, and evangelize them by loving them. Most of these guys, uh, I I think, uh, again, nationwide, it's 80% are the children of unwed mothers. So they don't know the dads. Oftentimes, they don't know them. The tiniest percentage come from an intact family. And at that prison, they said it might be even higher than 80%, maybe close to 90%. And in that situation, a group of Texas ranchers love these guys and show them how much they love these guys who didn't know a dad and they're like a dad. But also, they come to say, it's not just about us loving you. This is about you knowing Jesus, about you coming to a relationship with him and knowing the truth of what is right and wrong. They don't, you know, mince words. They say the fullness of the truth, call them to confession, call them to the the sacraments. And I could see that after these guys were working for the last two or three years, what a tremendous difference. I've been to prisons before. I've never seen a group like this. They're so impressive because it's what this here is teaching. The more they entrust themselves to the gospel and open themselves up to Christ, the more their humanity is affirmed. One of just a little way, a small way, that is so clear. With these guys, race made no difference. White guys, Hispanic guys, and black guys were all sitting together and friends with each other and joking around with each other and helping each other. Because In most prisons, race is an absolute barrier. In this community, they recognize not that they belong to a black race, Hispanic race, or white race, but that in Jesus Christ, they belong to the redeemed human race. And that's what mattered, not their their, their ethnic background and color. And that just by itself was a tremendous gift that Christ has brought them. And this is the kind of transformation Christ will do for all of us. That is what we seek. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, I'll come back and take a look at some emails and questions. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to again invite you to come and join us. If you can be part of our studio audience, please contact our uh, pilgrimage department by calling them at 205 271 2966 or go to the website ewtn.com and they will give you information about uh, the scheduling of masses and uh, television, live television shows and uh, places to stay, good places to eat. Um, we always love it when you go to the Arndale Cafe and get those fried green tomatoes that made that movie famous. That, actually, the book was written across the street. And of course, our religiously themed restaurants, Golden Rule, Barbecue, and Hamburger Heaven. So that's what happens to those poor critters. All right, but do come there. And then, of course, they'll give you directions on how to get out to Hansville and uh, go and pray some time with the sisters. Beautiful up there, and we'd love to have you. All right, let's take some emails here. First one is from Tom in Dalton, Pennsylvania. Father Paquil, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, CCC, and the Aquinas Catechism use the phrase, quote, in case of necessity with respect to lay baptism. My sister's grandson was not baptized by his parents who exhibit no intention of having their son baptized. In that event, my sister baptized her grandson. Does her action rise to the level of, quote, necessity? Tom and Dalton. Uh, no, Tom, it does not. And this is, this is a problem because her children do not intend to raise the child uh, a Catholic or give them instruction in the faith. Now, I have no idea why not. Um, and I would have that conversation with them, but now, uh, there, there's, that's not a case of necessity. And what they need to, uh, what, what your sister needs to do is, you know, carefully, and I know it's, it's sensitive, but carefully and gently engage in a conversation, an ongoing conversation about the salvation Jesus Christ calls for. I will bet that her son and daughter-in-law, uh, or wh whatever it is, uh, you know, that, that her, 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 you know, the parents of the grandson, um, I'll bet they only look at baptism as A, something to please grandma, and B, about joining the Catholic Church, and that C, they do not see it in any connection with the salvation Jesus Christ has won for us. They don't, probably don't even know the passage in 1 Peter 3.20, baptism now saves you. They don't know that when you're baptized, as Romans 6 teaches, when you're baptized, uh, you ent you're baptized into his death so that you can rise again. They, now maybe the, the child is getting a little bit old, I don't know how old the child is now, but uh, when they first see the child, say, oh, he's so innocent and all that. Believe me, they'll get over that because he won't stay that innocent. And they'll see that he can be uh, pretty self-centered. Uh, that's because that's what kids do. Uh, they want their needs met, and they want them met now. Whether it's good for them or not, they want them met now. And so they'll, they'll learn that. But they need to understand their own relationship with Christ. They don't see any urgency for Jesus in their own lives. So how are they possibly going to have any sense of urgency for their son? 
They won't. And that's where you have to evangelize them. And the problem that your sister has is she cannot guarantee that her children will raise the grandson in the faith. And she can't guarantee that she'll be able to either. That's the problem of this. So now, if the child was in danger of death, by all means baptize the child, no doubt. Nurses and doctors in hospital who have a child that's at risk uh, should baptize the child. Uh, absolutely, that's, that's a good case of an emergency. Um, one of my favorite stories is when I lived in Nashville, uh, a man was, about, was walking out the hospital to go call the pastor of St. Henry's, Monsignor Roland, God rest his soul. And he was uh, going out there uh, to get him, and Monsignor Roland was walking in the door. He had been reading in his study and uh, felt an urge he had to go to the hospital. And again, that's uh, where guarded angels come in. He, he had this impulse, he just, I need to go. So he went. And as he went over, met this guy, he said, quick, my wife is dying uh, in childbirth. The baby's already dead, and she's dying, losing a lot of blood. So he went over there. He saw the baby's body, conditionally baptized it, went over to the uh, mom and gave her the uh, anointing of the sick. Well, not only did the mom do fine, she, she's, she's still fine, but the baby came back to life. And I met him when he was about uh, three and a half years old. So um, the, I, I was very impressed by the power of baptism, even in that kind of late emergency. And any lay person can baptize a child, not only a priest. So that would be the necessity, but not just because your children won't baptize them. All right, we have here um, a letter from Catherine in Houston, Texas. Father Mitch, my husband and I got married in the Catholic Church, but outside the United States, America. He is a non-practicing Buddhist. He watches TV and listens to Joel Olstein who's also in Houston, and some other channel, but not uh, but except for EWTN. During Christmas Day, he likes to go with me to attend Mass. Always pray. By the grace of God, he will convert to Catholicism. My question is, can, can you recommend a good book for him to read about Catholicism? Catherine in Houston. Well, Catherine, um, one of the things I would ask him is, why do you like uh, coming to Christmas Mass? What is it that you like? And not to, you know, why do you come to Mass? No, no. You know, he's already making a step. So ask him, what is there that attracts you to Mass on Christmas Eve? And he may have, you know, some answers, find out what it is. And if, if he has something that he finds very fascinating, um, then maybe get a book about the nativity. But in terms of the whole of Catholicism, one of the books I strongly recommend is by Fathers Tregilio, our own Father Tregilio and Father Briganti, uh, called Catholicism for Dummies. Now, Please do not get me wrong. I am not calling your husband a dummy. This is part of a series. They have computers for dummies, baseball for dummies. They have hundreds of these titles. Everything's for dummies. Basic people that don't know. They did the one on Catholicism, and it's very, very good. I don't recommend, uh, personally, the one that, that there's, a, there's, there's a dummies series, and then there's for Idiots series. Catholicism for Idiots, I, I don't think is very good as the Catholicism for Dummies. So go with the Dummies, avoid the Idiots, <laughs> to the best of your ability. And um, uh, that would be a great uh, basic 
and simple explanation of the faith as a good introduction. Now, he might need an even more basic introduction to Christianity. And for that, I would recommend two authors. One, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. That would be very good. Also, I would recommend a, 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 a book by the great G.K. Chesterton called The Everlasting Man. Those are a couple very, very good books uh, to help understand what Christianity is about. Uh, or C.S. or uh, G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy. That's also very, very well done. All right, there's another email. This is from Judy in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. That's way out west and way up north. A lot of cowboys out there. Father Mitch, a woman questioned the placement of the tabernacles in our Catholic churches on one of your recent shows. I've noticed that the tabernacles are often placed on the side of the altars also. And I find this rather strange and off-centered. Am I wrong to feel that the tabernacle in Jesus should be at the center of our sanctuaries? Judy in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. <coughs> yes, Judy, I do believe that uh, Jesus, present in the tabernacle, should be at the center so that our attention is on him. Now, I understand why some of the architects and liturgists moved the Blessed Sacrament over to a side altar. The reason is the priest is facing toward the people when he celebrates Mass. And he doesn't want to be blocking the tabernacle. So that is why they do that. But there are a variety of ways you can deal with that. Some parishes have. Uh, I still like having the Blessed Sacrament at the center. And you know, it's good for us to keep our focus. Um, we went through a period where it was moved out of the church and off to the side completely uh, because the focus was on the community rather than on Jesus. That's a mistake. Jesus and focusing on Jesus is what makes the church community the church. We don't do it by our own power. That would be following the Pelagian heresy that we save ourselves. We don't make the church by ourselves. It is Christ who is the center, and He is the one that forms us into His body. He is the head. We are members of the body, and that focus on Him must be central. We have our, another email here. Hi, Father Paqua. My 13-year-old son plays video games such as the Legend of Zelda series and an online game called Minecraft. In addition, he would like to get a Pokemon, a Pokemon game for Christmas. He is concerned, however, that playing these games may be dangerous because they make use of powers in reference to the occult. Please let me know what you would advise. This is from Lisa in Trinity, Florida. Well, Lisa, a couple things. Um, I'm not such a big fan of kids doing too much gaming. I would, first of all, want to make sure that he gets outside and plays, plays with other kids, not with computers, gets outside and gets a lot of exercise. You know, uh, the wife of President Obama, Michelle Obama, has been very strong, I think, giving some very good advice in encouraging kids to get more exercise and eat more healthily. Um, it's a good idea to get out there. That's why I'm, uh, I've been a big fan 
of various forms of scouting, the American Heritage Girls for girls, and scouting has been generally very good for boys. Um, to get out there is a, a, a great idea so that kids know more about nature, use their imagination instead of having their imagination done for them. It's good to uh, make sure that they get uh, a sense of getting out there and engaging nature on its own terms, okay? So in terms of games that do references to the occult, I don't like that either. I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know anything about the intricacies of these games, um, but I, I, I really don't like it uh, when you say that there's the uh, occult powers uh, being involved. If there, you know, some games are historically oriented and try to, you know, get you in contact with stages of the development of civilizations. You can learn something from that. Not tremendous amount, but something. But uh, these other kind of things, if he's nervous about it, what, he's at, what I think is he's asking you to help him get off of it. That would be my sense, okay? All right, let's take um, still one more uh, email. Here we have one from Regina. Father Mitch, as you know, there have been many, great many installations of bishops around the United States recently. Do you have any idea how long it might be after bishop submits his mandatory resignation at age 75 until an answer is given by the Pope? In the past, in another state, there was a time that our sea was empty for two years. Is there a general expectation now for that span of time, or is it just wait and see what happens situation? Regina. Uh, Regina, the reality is that uh, a lot of times they're looking for the right bishop for that particular diocese. We had a two-year wait over here in Alabama, too, looking for somebody that fits this diocese and can minister best to it. And so some dioceses, they, they know that the bishop's resignation is coming up, and they start looking for somebody early on, but uh, not uh, everywhere. And so that's, that's the problem and getting bishops that, that are qualified for, for doing that. But there's no expectation that it'll be two years. They want it more quickly, um, as they do in many places. Uh, so that's, you know, just one of those circumstances that comes up. All right. Let's get started here with paragraph 103. We'll go back to this maybe. Answered all the emails. He begins in paragraph 103 saying, Philosophy is a mirror that reflects the culture of the people. It's an interesting image. A philosophy which responds to the challenge of the demands of theology and evolves in harmony with faith is part of that evangelization of culture, which uh, Blessed Paul VI proposed as a fundamental goal of evangelization. So this is a very important thing. We want to evangelize not only individuals, but cultures. And Blessed Paul VI wrote, in Evangelii Nunciandi, paragraph 20, which is his great encyclical on evangelization of other people, where he says, all this could be expressed in the following words. What matters is to evangelize man's culture and cultures, not in a purely decorative way, as it were, by applying a thin veneer, but in a vital way, in depth, and right to their very roots, always taking the person as one starting point, and always coming back to the relationships of people among themselves and with God. 
Now, think about this. The modern culture in the West needs a lot of evangelization. The culture accepts a lot of very bad behavior. Think of the indecent way so many people dress. I'll be going to, uh, and I remember, the first time I ever flew uh, in a plane was back in the 60s for a senior trip in high school. We went to Washington, New York. We wore suit jackets to fly. Today, people are practically walking around in their boxer shorts or less. And you know, it, so you see, and culture accepts that. Culture accepts rudeness more easily. Crudeness, ugliness in art, and a wide variety of things. And this requires an evangelization of the culture so that the instinct of the culture will be towards dignity. Cultures that are divided along racial issues need to be evangelized so that the inherent dignity of every group and subgroup within a culture is honored. And cultures need to be evangelized so that there's a care for the poor, for the disabled, whether physically or mentally, and other issues. All of these things must be dealt with. That's the evangelization of whole cultures. And he, the, the Pope, uh, St. John Paul, urgently called for a new evangelization, not new in the sense that you change the gospel. The gospel is the same, but it's new because societies that once had been Christian now have fallen away, and the culture is not so Christian. And they need to have an evangelization of individuals to find salvation as well as of the culture. And this is a way that he now appeals to philosophers to explore the, the dimensions of what is true, good, and beautiful to which the Word of God gives access. And this is all the more urgent if you consider the challenges of this new millennium, this 21st century, which affect in a particular way regions and cultures that have a long-standing Christian tradition. Long-standing Christian cultures are now accept, have accepted abortion, euthanasia, and many forms of drugs and violence, etc., and the breakdown of the family. And that philosophy could help us with this. This attention to philosophy should also be seen as a fundamental and original contribution in service of the new evangelization. This is our goal to do this new evangelization, and philosophy will help us to think through why the breakdown of family is not only not Christian, but is less than human. And so many other things about the role of drugs, etc. that this will be a great help for philosophy and science. And the church wants us to use and develop all of that so that the culture has more deeply entrenched within it a love of Christ and the values and morality of the gospel. Well, we have to bring it to an end. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And of course, this show can be brought to you only by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. God bless you. Thank you.